Hello and welcome to the Design Operations Symposium 2021, the inaugural Design Operations Symposium co-located with the Festival of Creative Ops and the Photo Studio Ops Forum. I'm Tom from Henry Stewart. Uh, there'll be plenty of talks going on today and you can join the discussion about the Design Operations Symposium on the Henry Stewart Creative Ops LinkedIn and Twitter pages using the hashtag Design Ops Symposium. I'd like to introduce our event chair for today, Jelana Wilson. She is the head of Design Ops at Zendesk. Thank you very much for joining us, Jelana. Over to you. Thank you, Tom. Welcome everyone to the Design Ops Symposium 2021. My name is Jelana and I'm delighted to be your host for today. I do lead the design uh, operations global team at Zendesk based in San Francisco, where I live right in the heart of this bustling city with my four kids and my husband. And we welcome you for, from wherever you're joining us in the world. As we come together today to hear from design operations leaders and practitioners, we'll share some insights and learnings that we can hopefully take away and apply in our own respective contexts and organizations. It has never been more true that the world is changing on a daily basis. So much has exponentially changed for all of us as a global design ops community, especially over the last two years. We've learned so much through a pandemic about ourselves and our own resilience as a human race, and we've all been deeply affected by this shared experience. As a result of the world changing, the demand for ops has also changed. Before the pandemic, being a remote or distributed employee wasn't a far-fetched notion. In fact, many teams like my own were already tackling the challenges of growing globally distributed workforces. However, when a pandemic forced us all to be immediately distributed and disconnected from in-person collaboration, design teams everywhere felt that disruption and quickly realized our processes aren't quite as buttoned up as we thought, which has increased the demand for operational excellence now more than ever. We really need rigor and process to be able to function. We've come a long way in the last few years in establishing design operations as a practice, building out toolkits, developing process maps, aligning on best practices and design quality standards, establishing standards, uh, title, career architectures, and more. Recently, Angelo Sarnis published the State of the Design Ops 2021 report, which aims to study the field of design operations professionals and report on how it evolves in the future. It is so impactful to the evolution of our field to have these types of insights from people who are starting the practice, people who wanna evolve the practice, and people who wanna evolve the community itself. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to check it out. Some really valuable insights in there. Now, one of the key things that I've learned from tuning into conferences just like this one um, and talking to fellow practitioners is that there's no one right way to apply design operations. Today, we're thrilled to have experts that will be talking to us all day about design ops. And hopefully we'll learn some new tips and tricks for how to boost operational rigor, mobilize design teams, create efficiencies and connect our teams to information and each other in this digital first working environment. But at the end of the day, the application and expression of design ops is really unique to each company. It's helpful coming here to hear more and learn new methods, frameworks, lots of takeaways, but then taking that, mapping it back to the needs of your business, your company and your team. So hopefully, where, whether you're just starting your design ops journey as a team of one, which many of you are, I imagine, or maybe you're part of an established design ops team of 21, you can walk away with some added tools in your tool belt today to be able to go back and apply to your own context as you seek to further establish design operation best practices where you are. This may just be an entry point for you in joining this conversation today. Attending conferences like this are so enriching and informative but this really is just a place to start. I encourage you to explore further. There's so many design operations communities popping up worldwide. It's so exciting for me um, to, to see this happening. A few of them are represented here as sponsors today, Design Ops LOL, Design Ops Assembly, which I'm a part of here in San Francisco. These and other design ops communities are filled with people just like you and me who are eager to talk about design ops. We can learn from each other. The most important thing that we should take away from today is that you're not alone in doing this work. Things are gonna to continue to change around us and that demands that we as design ops practitioners change and adapt right with it. 
So I encourage you to plug into your local design ops community to continue the conversation. Thank you again for tuning in today from across the globe for this bumper to bumper celebration of all things creative, design and photo studio ops. And thank you to our sponsors for your support of these events. Now let's go over just a few housekeeping items as we kick things off. If you want to find out more about the sponsors, win great prizes, chat to team members, you can click on the exhibition tab. And then for our returning colleagues, you probably noticed the platform was updated a little. So you'll now find the community feed on the right-hand side of the panel of your screen. Here, you can engage with fellow attendees throughout the event by posting questions, images, polls. We encourage you to use that. And then you can find all the live sessions in the agenda tab. Remember, your registration includes access to co-located Festival of Creative Ops, Photo Studio Ops, Forum 2, all of it. So pop on over there when you get a chance. During sessions, we encourage you to chat with fellow attendees and of course, make the most of the expert lineup that we have. Submit your questions. We will, we will do our best to get through them. Use the panel on the right-hand side of your screen to do that. And then be sure to check out the lounge tab throughout the event for real-time networking with industry peers and the competitions tab to win some great prizes. And then if at any point in the event you need assistance, please use the little chat bot on the bottom right of your screen. And last but not least, we have some really exciting news for the creative operations community. Registration has just opened for Henry Stewart's upcoming 2022 in-person event. Yay! In New York and London. We're so delighted for the return of in-person events with the safety of attendees, speakers, and sponsors, of course, is top priority. So save your spot for next year, take advantage of the launch offers. It's available for a limited time only. We're excited to raise a glass in person so very soon. And now for our keynote, I'm delighted to introduce Leslie Kozier, who leads the design ops team at TikTok. Leslie builds the design up, she built the design ops team rather from the ground up and considers her team to still be a work in progress as it continues to evolve today. Today, Leslie is gonna share with us how she jumpstarted the design ops team at TikTok and what are some of the first steps that we need to take to get a design ops work up and running. So over to you, Leslie, welcome to the main stage. Thanks so much, Delana. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be with you all today. And um, thanks so much for Henry Stewart for inviting me here to share a little bit about my journey through design ops at TikTok. So we can dive right in. Let me share my screen. Great. How am I looking here? I'll let Jelana tell me if it's uh, if it looks incorrect. All good. Okay, perfect. All right. So, how I jump started design ops at TikTok. Uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time today sharing with you all about uh, my three years at TikTok. Um, I've been there for a while, even before it was TikTok, and um, I came into design ops through my job at TikTok, and you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, throughout this session. All right. So who am I? I thought I would tell you a little bit about myself um, outside of work first, just to get a little more of a round, well-rounded picture of who I am, um, since we're not, we're not just our jobs, uh, before we get into all the fun design ops stuff. So here's sort of a, a visual of, <laughs> who I am. Um, this is a uh, just a, a broad overview of things that I like. Uh, in the middle, there's my husband and I. Uh, we have a, a, veg a very large vegetable garden. I've built several planters in our backyard um, to grow vegetables. Uh, and that you can see on the top left, um, I have a kitten that I absolutely love and is my entire life, basically. And uh, you, can <laughs> you can find her at at Life of Anchovy on Instagram, if you'd like to follow some kitten content and help me uh, grow my following. Uh, and then on the top right, uh, I, I love playing cards and playing games. So uh, I do that pretty much every weekend, along with uh, drinking wine and cocktails whenever I can. So that's a little bit about me outside of work. And I am going to try to put this on Do Not Deserve. There we go. Uh, all right. So that's that, and now on to the fun stuff. 
I have had a very non-traditional journey into design ops. Um, I actually started as a video editor at Musical.ly at the time before it was TikTok. Um, that was my background. I did video and photography content um, uh, my, for most of my career. And I was hired on as an individual contributor at, uh, at Musical.ly. And um, at the time, I was one of the only creatives that was hired uh, very early on just to create the social content. Um, and within a few months, uh, we grew to, into a very small creative team, but there really wasn't any process um, and no, there weren't any producers, no project managers, nothing like that on the creative side. It was just uh, graphic designers, myself, 3D designer, motion designers, et cetera. Um, and then around the time that we became TikTok, the size of our projects started getting larger and larger. Maybe some of you can relate to this as your companies are growing. And uh, because we didn't have any producers or project managers, my manager asked me if I would be interested in project managing. Um, and it just started as one project. I still remember it was uh, an app store redesign uh, that I had to project manage. And um, I thought, well, I've never done this before, but why not? Let's do it. I'll try it out. And, uh, and spoiler alert, I absolutely loved it. I, I loved my experience project managing from that first, um, that, that first project. And I felt uh, that I enjoyed it even more than video editing, honestly, and it felt like an even better fit for me. And so that was sort of the start of my new chapter. I started project managing more and more um, on an individual case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> and then within that first year, of being at Musical.ly and we'd become TikTok, et cetera. Uh, I was offered to transition into a full-time position as the design ops manager. And uh, at, just like Jelana said, some of you are, I was a, a you know a, a one woman team. Um, and even though I was the in, entire uh, design ops team, we had uh, quite a few designers. And so I was tasked with implementing a process that optimized the creative workflows since we were scaling at a very rapid pace some of you might imagine. So scaling design ops. Um, even before I was asked to project manage and ops manage, I was extremely aware that our creative team needed process. I was a video editor, an independent co contributor working within the system that wasn't really working. So here are some observations that um, I made at the time. Probably the biggest uh, issue that I saw, um, that I observed, was working in silos. Um, I believe that working in silos is actually a huge, uh, is a root of a lot of the pain points that come when it, when it comes to uh, not having process, confusion that comes from it, consequences that comes from not having process. And a lot of that uh, stems from working in silos. So here's just like a visual of, um, what it looks like, a uh, very, very general, <laughs> simplified, minimalist visual of how it looks to work in silos and, and what I would observe, right? So even just from the visual, you can see that, um, well, breaking down what you see here on the left, uh, cross-functional partners, we're an in-house in design team, so we call our clients, so to speak, partners, but maybe you call them clients or something else. And then on the right, you have the creatives. Uh, essentially what we had at the time was anyone could just walk up to any desk and ask for something, right? If you go up, oh, I know there's a designer over there. I'll go and ask for a creative need that I have, um, to varying degrees of scope. And what would happen was some people would get like, this person is hard at work today, has three people asking for something, the second, this second individual. Um, I just realized you maybe can't see my cursor, but, um, the second one from the from the top on the right side uh, has three arrows, whereas the third person on the right um, doesn't have anybody approaching their desk and asking them to support their design needs. So there's a lot of imbalance, even just from, from looking at this example. Somebody might go to three different people, someone might always go to the same person. So uh, it was essentially, the lack of process meant that anyone who had a design need could walk up to a desk. The consequences of working in silos are for the designers divided attention. So the designers are splitting their attention between project managing for themselves. They're also communicating with their partners. 
and they're also doing their design work. Because their attention is so divided, it actually means that they're spending less time doing the creative work, which is what uh, they were hired to do. And on top of that, I would say, some of you guys might've experienced this, not all designers excel at project managing and communicating with partners. So a lot of times, uh, a lot of times they might struggle with that or that might take more time or make them uncomfortable because that may not be their strength. In fact, their strength may be strictly the creative side of things. Um, and then the other aspect is lack of creative collaboration for designers. So if you're working in silos, it usually means that there's no one who's responsible for initiating any creative collaboration because everyone's working individually and on their own, and that can hinder creative innovation. For the partners, uh, I would say that uh, there are a lot of consequences of working silos. One would be that there are varied expectations depending on each designer's preferences and working styles. So a partner, a client may not know what they're gonna get because they go to one person and maybe that person needs two days to complete a particular uh, request. And you might go to another person, that, might, that person might only need two hours to complete that same request. And a lot of that comes down to maybe bandwidth or that person's experience or really just the speed at which they work. There could be a, a variety of reasons that um, there's this variance. But what it does mean is that the partners, every time they go to somebody new, there may be a new expectation and they may not have um, a foundation of what, what they can know to expect for a particular scope of work. Secondly, it's, it may not be clear to who to reach out to for a partner. So they most likely, if you have this sort of model, so to speak, of, of the walking up to the desk, uh, most likely partners are gonna go to the people who they have pre-existing relationships with, have worked with before, if they're not familiar with creative processes, they might just be approaching someone who they know rather than the person who's actually the best fit for the job based on their skill set, experience, et cetera. And then lastly, for the stakeholders just across the board, uh, there's a lack of visibility and accountability across different stakeholders' work streams. So on the visibility side, what that could look like is you might have two partners who are requesting something very similar from two different designers. And without somebody who has visibility into both of those things, the two designers are working independently on something extremely similar. Maybe they decide to take two different approaches to it, but it's for the same campaign. Or uh, they might work on something independently that could have been consolidated into one, one ticket. And that would have then increased efficiency um, and not had to double up the work. And then on the accountability side, uh, I think we've all encountered what we lovingly call scope creep, uh, which is accountability to the original brief um, and making sure that whatever the expectations were agreed upon from that original brief are uh, consistent throughout the entire project. And I think when there's a lot of conversations and a lot of um, messaging and, and whatever it might be that's happening outside of of the process visibility, then a lot of times scope can creep up, um, it can increase, it can double, quadruple, et cetera. And that can be a strain on um, a designer's work pipeline. And then misunderstandings and communication about expectation and scope. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier, where you know not all designers are necessarily strong communicators, especially when it comes to being partner facing. I would say on the same side of it, partners aren't always strong at communicating either, especially if they're not familiar with creative processes and design language. Uh, they might struggle uh, to be able to communicate what they're hoping for, what they're asking for, or even to understand maybe any feedback. Um, so through that, there, it can lead to a lot of misunderstandings and maybe misunderstandings that you don't really realize until you know deliverable day. So in that case, there's not, there isn't someone present there to facilitate communication and act as like a translator of the design language and sort of optimize both people's objectives. Um, and so without a unified process, uh, there's also inconsistent creative brand strategy. So it's difficult to keep consumer facing creative consistent across your brand when everyone is working independently on their own. And consistency is very, very important to building a brand, especially creative consistency. 
Um, and so that's another consequence of working in silos. So in other words, you have chaos. So then how do you jumpstart design ops? Uh, I would say this GIF was chosen because it represents how I felt uh, at the time when I was tasked with, uh, with facilitating and rolling out process with the designers is I felt like a dog driving, which is that dogs don't know how to drive. Uh, and, but once I took a step back and thought about what my first steps would be, it became really clear to me what I wanted to do because I simply just asked myself what I would, how I would like to work as an independent contributor. How have I been working and how, and which aspects of that can I scale into a team setting um, and to benefit both the team as a whole and the individuals. So in that case, it was very beneficial to me that I had some background in being in IC. So the jumpstart. The jumpstart to me, in my experience at TikTok, was a single point of entry. I feel that having a single point of entry is a huge part of addressing the consequences that we just chatted through. And so now we've added design ops. Uh, we've got a little superhero here in the middle, that's us. And um, yeah, I found that having that touch point for all incoming creative needs helps address visibility. It helps address proper resourcing. And it can be as simple as an individual. That's what I was when I started, um, where I was the point of contact for any creative asks. And then as you grow and scale, you might it might become a team of people, or it might become more tool-based where it's a forum or something like that. But having that single point of entry, that funnel is really important. Uh, I found it to be extremely beneficial and bring a lot of value. And design ops, uh, this design ops point of entry also functions as a filter to help enforce the process that you've set up and to identify any blockers, pain points, even before it reaches the desk of a designer. So it's that initial intake um, and vetting of the request to make sure that it's either something that makes sense to be taken on by your design team or if it's something that needs to be flushed out more um, or more information is needed, et cetera. In other words, design ops, as design ops, we seek to remove distractions or noise that lives outside of creative design to allow creatives to do what they do best. So this is something that was a mantra to me internally as I was building the process was, what is, what is my goal? And, and yes, the goal is to optimize both partner and creative goal, like uh, both partner and creative objectives, but, um, my service to the design team specifically was to remove those distractions and noise that divided attention I was talking about so that they can simply be creative and do what they do best. That means that if a partner breaks out of the process, a creative is also empowered to redirect to that single point of entry and re redirect it to design ops. Um, I'm sure this is something that uh, some of you might relate to, and I know that we still experience day to day, is maybe someone's not familiar with the process or for a variety of reasons might, um, might, wanna, might wanna deviate from it, um, but the designer can always feel empowered and supported by this design ops infrastructure. That's there to support them. All right, so we jump started the car and now we have to keep the engine running. Um, I don't know anything about cars, but I was asked to give this keynote a title and then I called it jump. I used the word jumpstart in it. And then I felt bound to this, this car analogy after that. Uh, so we'll just say we're keeping the engine running here, even though cars aren't related to design ops really. Uh, I'm sure you need design ops to build cars. Anyway, I'm getting on a tangent here, but uh, I would love to talk a little bit more about um, some some philosophies that I find have brought value to uh, keeping your design ops team and systems successful. <clears throat> so here are three gears, so to speak, that, um, that stood out to me as I was preparing for today and what I felt brought value as, you, as I incorporated design ops and hopefully 
they might be helpful to you. And uh, I will dive into each of these a little bit more in the next few slides, but we can just go through them one at a time here. The first one is a proactive and reactive workflow. Second is a trust building process that's firm, fair, and consistent. And it's extremely important to build a process that is that builds trust. So your process has to build trust with the people that are working within it. And then the importance of culture. I would say there's probably a fourth point here, which would be tools, um, which I know that there's a lot of resources on. I wanted to focus today's conversation around more um, philosophical uh, aspects of design ops. And so not necessarily the more technical sides of tools, but um, would definitely encourage uh, you all to dive into those resources as well, since tools are instrumental to bringing value as well to your creative teams. But uh, for the sake of today's conversation, we'll focus on these three. So the first one is a proactive and reactive workflow. I have come to realize that almost all functions of design ops teams fall under either a proactive or reactive action. So here's what I mean. During project intake, so that's sort of that initial filter from that earlier slide. During project intake, when you're being proactive, you're removing pain points prior to project kickoff and resourcing designers. So you're actively, you're proactively trying to understand what the scope of work is, what's needed, removing pain points, addressing missing information, assets, or maybe talking through and ask that maybe is unrealistic. And absolutely, yes, this is a, this is a uh, very, very simplified um, description. And absolutely, sometimes you need to sit down with a partner and a designer, art director, whatever it might be, to figure out how you might move forward and how you might accomplish um, the deliverable. But uh, we should at least, at minimum, be addressing as much as we can during intake prior to uh, what's needed later, which may be a conversation where everyone sits down before we really determine what the resources are that are needed. But as much as possible should be done up front prior to looping in um, the people producing the work. And then on the reactive side, adjusting the pipeline and expectations when resources become bottlenecked. So this is basically if you know something comes in that's P0, it's the highest priority, and maybe you need to move around some stuff that's medium to low priority to, to make room for this high priority request. So you shuffle some things around, or um, maybe there's someone who's a really great fit for a project, but they have conflicts in their pipeline. So maybe some adjustments can be made there. So it's reacting to those needs as, as they come in um, and being flexible with uh, how you've resourced accordingly um, as any, any high priority requests might uh, change your your pipeline and then during the project management phase so now you're past the intake phase and now you're in in it you're at your kickoff <laughs> and uh, moving towards uh, delivery and and um, making sure that the campaign or project is properly executed so proactive management uh, I find that I I structured this in questions because I find that the questions can help drive a lot of the the decisions that you might make in these uh, various points of project management. So the question on the proactive side is, am I able to iterate to all stakeholders, the project background, its creative needs, and the steps required to execute the deliverables? So when it says all stakeholders, I would say this means both designers and, and the partners. Uh, am I able to tell the designers as though I was a partner, here's what's needed, but help translate some of those design language things for them um, that the partner may not necessarily be able to. Same with a partner. Am I able to break down the steps required? Maybe there's some something that they need to provide first um, and to be able to educate them and help them understand why uh, they might need to take certain actions in order for us to meet uh, whatever need they have. And on the reactive side, what is the next action I can take to move the blocker or pain point one step closer to being resolved? So what I find there is, you know, a lot of times it can be tempting to have an all or nothing approach to problem solving. If, if it feels like there's one piece that's missing or we're not really sure where to get that information or track down resolution, um, we can become a mobile. And I 
what I always try to encourage myself in and my team in as well is there's always something that you can, there's always an action that you can take to move the needle forward in some way, even if it's not full resolution. So for example, if I'm confused about an aspect of the ask, who do I need to talk to to clarify? Who can I reach out to for an answer? If I'm waiting on information, who can I follow up with? So there's always something that we can do to move the needle forward towards resolution with the end goal, of course, of resolving it um, as quickly as possible. All right, the second is a trust building playbook. So your process should build trust with your designers, your ops team, and your partners. So here are some three core values that I believe can help build trust with your process. First one is being fair, or firm, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fairness is the second one, being firm. Um, being firm is probably one of the most difficult things to do if you're me and you're a people pleaser and you wanna be a good partner, you wanna say yes to everything, you wanna do your job well. But, and of course we wanna support wherever we can and when we can, but we want to always assume that we're gonna follow the process and that's being firm. At the same time, we wanna be fair. So your process should be fair to both your partners and your designers. If you're structuring an entire process that only caters to the needs of a partner, most likely some designers might get burned in the process. If you're only catering to the, strictly the needs of the designers, then you may not meet the goals of the project or campaign at a higher level. So you wanna optimize the fairness when building a process. And of course, exceptions are bound to be are bound to happen. Um, you and you want to be fair when you're determining when to deviate from the core process. So, for example, TikTok is a trend based trend based platform, and there's always going to be certain situations that are reacting to a cultural moment. Uh, it's it's going to be a quick turn um, because you know what if you miss it, the moment's over. And a lot of times that means that we might have to seriously evaluate if we're going to deviate from our process um, because there's there's something that's come in that uh, requires that in order for us to support the need. Um, so it's important to know why you're deviating from the process when you are and and then when you choose to deviate that it's staying fair to the stakeholders and um, optimizes the goals of all stakeholders as well. And the last one is consistency. So if you're deviating so often that you don't even have a process anymore, then you're just back to what you were, what was happening before. And, uh, and so it's important to be consistent about following process as much as possible, and then being fair when you choose to, to deviate from it. And then I would say, if you are choosing to deviate, it's really important to communicate why. So that's why I've written here, deviating from the process too often or not communicating deviations can erode trust inside and outside of the team, right? You have people who are confused, whether it's partners, designers, why do we make exception in this place? Or I thought we had this process in place, what happened? So explaining why a decision was made can help build trust rather than compound the confusion. So it's, I think it's just very similar to a lot of things in life, which is essentially, if you're inconsistent about your expectations, it can fracture trust and, and cause people to feel confused. So in the words of Kramer, without rules, there's chaos. Okay, we're running a little close on time here. I'll try to move through this a little quicker. The last piece, which is certainly not the least important, I would say it's one of the most important is the culture. Team culture is very, very important. It impacts creativity. You want to build a psychologically safe place for you, your people to thrive and fail. Uh, having the freedom to throw something out there that might be a little crazy, that what, you just wanna try out something um, and having the safety to throw that out and not feel like it has to succeed is, um, is really important. And then you have quality of work. Your team will do their hardest and best work when they feel seen, heard and valued both inside of and also apart from their professional function. I firmly believe this, that in a fast-paced work environment, which TikTok is, there's a lot of pressure as well. And recognition can often fall through the cracks in a fast-paced environment. So it's important to take the time to recognize good work and take the time to recognize the human behind the work as well. 
And I've, I've personally seen a tangible difference of work ethic between those who feel recognized and those who don't. Uh, and then the last piece is employer retention. And do not underestimate the significance of genuine relationships and actionable ways to support work-life balance. So work-life balance shouldn't just be talked about, it should have actionable steps that doesn't just live in the theoretical. All right. And then last um, bit, my closing thought, is that here's a, a, what would be considered a reduction, a very simplified minimalist version of a traditional org at a company. You've got you know, your CEOs, executives, most senior, senior people, leadership on top, and mid to senior in the middle, junior at the bottom, and everyone's just sort of funneling up to help support the people at the top. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term servant leadership, but uh, I, I love this philosophy. I think that what we just saw is on the left, right, where that's a more traditional org. And I love the servant leader philosophy because it flips the org and uh, it talks about supporting your people and putting your people first and seeing your uh, people as resources rather than tools. And I think that the same can be said for design ops. Designers, creatives are at the top. That's our function is to support them. And as leaders, if you're a design ops leader, a leader's function is to lead through service. I am always trying to ask myself, yes, I have my own tasks and jobs that I need to get done. But if I'm only ever operating asking how my team can help me do my job, then that's not going to create goodwill or have a successful long-term um, team. And so what I would really like to ask myself more often than not is how can I help my team? So people managers and leaders supporting the producers and PMs so that they can then do their best work to support the designers and creative. So it's, I love the servant leadership philosophy and um, I believe that it helps to lead a team into su success long-term. And that is the last piece of that. Cheers. Thank you all so much for listening. And now I think we're gonna dive into some questions. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. I think we have time for one question. Um, so um, are there any, this is about tools. Are there any key campaign management, project management tools you implemented for your team to improve visibility and communication? Yeah, so we use a, at TikTok we use a, a a messaging system called Lark. So we're not in like, it's basically Slack for TikTok employees. Um, and so that was always an existing tool that was available. But when I started rolling out process, I used Asana. We still use Asana now. Um, we're actually exploring whether or not we want to look into other tools as we've gotten really, really large and whether or not Asana still serves its purpose. But when we were on the smaller side, it definitely worked. Um, and essentially having a form was just huge. I love having the form, like gotta fill out the form, gotta fill out the form. So I integrated a Google form into the Asana board and it funneled into that way because that was before Asana had the form feature. So there was a Google form integration that you can use. Um, and, but now, which is a little bit more robust, but now Asana has actually created forms. So you can do it that way as well. And that's what we do now is we use an Asana form. Gotta have the floor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, well, I think there's a couple more questions. So I, um, if you wanna continue the conversation with Leslie, you can join her in the lounge actually immediately after this session, you'll have a chance to get your questions answered. Um, thank you, Leslie, so much. That was uh, just really great. I think nuts and bolts of how to jumpstart a design ops organization from the ground up. So thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm.